I have been doing a lot of reading about fractals and uh, Fibonacci numbers as they relate to the stock market and seeing um, what's out there in terms of you know how, like who's thought about this from a scholarly perspective and what have they found out and um, while I'm not a mathematician I am a programmer and so I understand some of the, the ideas that they're putting out there but by no means do I understand the the proofs of them, um, but I'm grasping the concepts, and um, what it all boils down to for me is trying to understand why I um, make the moves that I do, and how they are related to um, the the mathematical derivatives, like the the, the like w why do I depend on mid candles of um, you know peak to troughs, and why do I depend on the 161 percent as a, a means to get out of those trades. Um, this, so it's it's been sort of on my mind and, and, and I read a paper recently or a blog post about um, the, it, it was really the mathematics of fractals and how you can predict stock market shifts, which I you know retweeted on my um, Twitter account, which is, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's definitely some math involved, but the concepts are, are pretty straightforward and that led me into a bunch of Google holes that I wanted to, to walk through um, because I found out a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, the, the, the main goal is trying to find out how much something costs. What, what is the value of something? How much does the stock market cost? And so I've been playing um, the S&P 500 index futures recently for uh, switched over to futures for a variety of reasons. Um, partially because I feel like it being an index, it reflects an overall um, market sentiment that is divorced from a, a particular stock. Um, so like say Apple may have some news that can shift this for sure um, by multiple points in, in many cases because it's such a big component of it. But overall, the, the stock market itself is, is reacting to all of the various components of its stocks, which then sort of roll up into this, this number. Um, and that's the, that's, the whole, that's the whole point of it. It's distilling complexity into a single price. Um, when the market closed, that price was um, you know $4,084. Why is it worth that? Well, that's just what buyers and sellers agreed on. But why did they agree on that? Why is that the price that that it ended on? Why did it why did it hit this high and then and then go down? Why was it that uh, that it passed through this is the 50 daily 50 SMA um, which I have a, a study called Moving Average that you can find um, just look in my Twitter profile my pin tweet has a, a link to the the google doc that all of my studies are in um, but this shows me what the the daily 50 sma was and i used that on friday to um enter this enter this trade and i understood at the time that what i was doing like because it, it had broken through in pre-market um failed broke through again retested um tried to keep going couldn't retested again tried to keep going couldn't broke back down through Normally, you would look at this price action and think, "Well, it couldn't make it, so it's gonna it's gonna die." But for whatever reason, I decided that I wanted to get in. I, I knew that I wanted to get into this as low as possible, so I waited for it to hit down here, and that's where I entered. Because um, for whatever reason, my the pattern recognition machine in my brain had decided that this trend long term was was actually positive, even though it, it was locally negative, um, and that got me thinking about all kinds of stuff what goes into figuring out what this price is. Um, and it's all based on the algorithm of buying low and selling high. I mean, that's, that, that is, at, at its root, that is how you determine uh, value and everything follows from that algorithm. Um, and because it's a, it's a mathematical algorithm of buying, buying low, selling high, like you have all of these actors in the market trying to do that. And people talk about market makers setting prices, which I mean, is, is it's a fine fiction to try to understand price action, but there's not some magical group of people who are saying that, you know, the bills are never going to win the Super Bowl. I mean, it's it's realistically price is determined by um, how, how the price action moves through time. And and obviously, larger world events can, can trigger things. Um, but when you're looking at an index, it's the entire market. So it sort of smooths out a lot of stuff other than the bigger picture moves. Um, 
so it, it comes down to randomness and how you can sort of add probabilistic reactions to random movements. I mean, otherwise, random movements can provide order. And how does that work? Um, it, finding a value of something is a moving target because of volatility. Um, like, obviously, when, when the day starts, this, this here, this burst of volume here is, is when uh, the market opened in the U.S. And that created a lot more volatility than there was previously. Um, so there's no predicting anything, right? I mean, you can just sort of like guess and hope you're right and have risk management in place in case you're wrong, but then, you know, figure out like w then where you're going to exit. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do that, and I'll get into that later. Um, but it is a moving target because of that, that volatility. And a lot of people have suggested that it's completely random. Um, but does that mean it's unpredictable? And... I mean, definitely people are making money off the market. So obviously it's it's possible to add a probabilistic interpretation of price action uh, in the same way that it's possible to win money at, at poker, you know, by uh, managing your risk and understanding the statistical probabilities of, of various hands. It's it, in, in the exact same way you can manage your risk and interpret the probabilities of price action to optimize a trade. Um, to get in as low as possible and out as as high as possible, so that's the the goal is how do you judge that risk um, and and knowing that 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 these are all chaotic oscillations, um, trying to find a value that is a moving target um, that can help you understand what the more optimized entries and exits are. Like you want to you want to enter at an extreme and exit at the other extreme, you don't want to enter in the middle because then, you know, if you, let's say you found value there and price doesn't move, like here, you were to enter on that, that 50 SMA level, um, price just sort of wanders around it for a while. I mean, like there's, there's no, there's no real value in here because that's the value at this point. Um, that's what consolidation is. It's, it's finding the value and sticking with it for a while until it hits another tipping point and moves one direction or the other. And you can see this on any scale. This happens to be a, you know, six minute, um, but you can see it on the one minute. You can see it on um, the 30 minute. There's, there's all kinds of like, here's the one hour, here's a four hour. Like you can see these periods of consolidation that are then uh, b break out into volatility that that is is the price action moving um, in one direction or another and overall you can see like the market has been downtrending here it goes up again downtrend some more um, these are these are uh, this is actually a trend line that I drew from uh, like a couple of weeks back that has been really consistent um, in and the market has been sort of following that trend down and I drew it as a channel off of um, actually it was a higher uh, it, it, this is from a higher higher order um, chart level. Let's see if we can see it here. Um, so I, I drew it as a, originally this was the trend that I drew and it was actually just off of this. This is a normal trend line that I always draw, but I keep old trend lines around and if they keep getting respected like this, then I'll keep them around forever. Um, so this is obviously one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So like, like two weeks um, and change, three weeks since this was initially formed and yet price has been sort of oscillating around it and that's why i mean it's just it's made up it's a useful gauge for me but i, I created a channel based on this um this extreme that it reached and then it plunged really far after that um there was i believe uh the FOMC. I don't remember what the what the what people said the cause was, but I mean that that doesn't necessarily mean that's what the cause was. I mean that that is just a um, yeah, that's just what it was attributed to. And yeah, I mean sure it probably had some um, bearing on the movement, but it it you know who knows exactly. But it then bounced off the 50 SMA and like so. At what point does um, saying that having that announcement here means it's going to go down this far. Well, nobody knows. I mean, how, how far is it going to go down? How do you even catch the bottom on something like this? I'm sure I probably tried um, and failed. So this upper part of the channel, then days later, you can see price interacting with it again. Um, anyway, so that's kind of one of, one of the, the, the ways that I know that this is uptrending is that this has finally broken this trend. And so like sometime around, you know, four or five days ago, the beginning of last week, um, it had turned. I didn't recognize it as a turn until it, it broke through that channel again. And then I was like, well, maybe this is a turn. And then it consistently went up through pre-market. And so that's when I sort of decided that I was going to be long biased after, you know, for so long being short biased. 
Um, so I, I just sort of decided I, it, that it was going to be going up. So all of these factors are things that contributed to, um, these are all patterns within these local oscillations that, that I've been playing with. Um, there's, there's also a bunch of like confluence and structure and price that, that are also probabilistic. Um, you know, a lot of these levels you'll see match. Like these are these are risk levels from the Jimmy Momo zones that are that are um, also overlaid with the 50 SMA at this point for a while before it starts coming back up again. Um, and and this convergence sort of convinces me that a lot of this stuff is mathematically derived. It has nothing to do with um, well, it, it it has more to do with the the mathematical underlying structure of it than it does with say an FOMC event. Like that'll that'll be a triggering event, but it doesn't it doesn't explain why these levels are overlapping when they they otherwise have nothing to do with each other. Um, so the what I started doing was was digging through a bunch of um, information about fractals about Fibonacci numbers about like what like wh these are all things that I've been fascinated by um, in in just sort of noticing these probabilistic correlations in the in the confluence and I wanted to have a deeper understanding about why they do what they do um, so you know, I, I guess the way I organized all of this information was by date so like how far back it goes um, the first the first thing that like mathematically that jumps out is the golden ratio which is dating all the way back to the ancient Greeks um, they had all kinds of, of uh, things that they wanted to say about, here, let's jump into Fibonacci, um, the, 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 golden ratio, the golden ratio. So Fibonacci was the first person to really popularize um, Arabic numerals in the first place, but also concepts like the golden ratio into Western um, civilization. I mean, his, so he was back in 1202. The Greeks were um, in, I, I think, further back in, in uh, you know, 1000 BC or so, or whenever Euclid was. Um, but they started realizing that this golden ratio was actually a very important um, thing. And I'll get a little bit more into the, the golden ratio um, uh, after this. But the, the Fibonacci number is, well, like Fibonacci popularized it originally. It came from India, like way, way back. And they even described it in terms of rabbits and he just re-described it. Um, but you can see this is like the, these, this is the Fibonacci sequence, and the ratio between them converges on that that golden golden ratio, that 1.168. So you can see as as you you um, uh, the, it's the, the the sum of each preceding terms is the next in the sequence, and if you are to um, look at like divide the number by the previous number it converges on the golden ratio and this looks just like a, a stock oscillation you know this looks exactly like it bouncing up to a peak and then coming down to the 50 percent mark and then up a little bit and then converging on the the golden ratio um, another way to think about the golden ratio is it's 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 just a uh, like this rectangle here is a is a golden golden ratio rectangle so the golden ratio is the the ratio of the whole to this line is the golden ratio. So th this golden rectangle is um, a rectangle in which the the length of the side to the, the other side is that is that ratio such that you can if, when you create a square, the resulting rectangle is also a golden rectangle, um, and you can keep doing that infinitely. This is where the, the golden spiral comes from. If you draw a curve through each one of these. Um, squares then it will curve like a spiral galaxy or like a snail shell i mean this is found throughout nature and this is because it's part of the the, the way physics works i mean it's the most efficient way of doing whatever in in whatever way um, but it's all based on these these numbers i mean this is how fast you can grow rabbits you know um this is it, it shows up everywhere i mean it's it's all over the place so it's it's not even a surprise that it would show up in um, the stock market like why wouldn't it of, of course it would because it's it's part of the the mathematics of how these numbers work because of the algorithm of buying and selling um, so anyway um, I think Kepler was the one who originally realized that that ratio of consecutive Fibonacci numbers converges on that on the golden mean and so this is the relationship between the Fibonacci numbers and the that that golden ratio um, 
and this this is how uh, like retracements. If, if you ever wondered where those numbers come from on Fibonacci retracements, they are derived by dividing the current number by one to three places to the right. And you can do this with any of them to to um, get those numbers. But they converge on the the like you know the the sixty one point eight and the thirty two point whatever. Um, those are all derived from these Fibonacci numbers. So it's like this number divided by this one is the first set. That's sixty one point eight, I think. And then this one divided by like four divided by six would be the the next one um, so those percentages are actually derived from these fibonacci numbers and you can see them playing out all the time in um in in how these fib the, the fib extensions work you know so if you just take that a step further the um you take one plus 61.8 and that's the 161 fib and this one is just incredible for for me for for being able to find uh, places to get in and out of, of trades like this. This isn't extended all the way across, but this is the 161 of the opening range. The opening range started here. Um, actually, it started down here. Uh, and then uh, in, in a half an hour, it got to about here. So this was where, where the opening range was. Um, and then the 50% of that is down here, but that's not, obviously the, the price kept going up at that point. Um, but it sort of danced around this this 161 level for a little while. It, it went up and, and around and oscillated right around this level. So this is where value was for a while. And it's nothing more than a fiction. It's a derived number. It has nothing to do with anything other than it's part of the, the mathematics of of price action how it works and so like yeah the value was this 161 for a little while and then when it broke through and finally retested at that point you know you could probably count on it going up it's the same with the opening range when it when when price came down to the opening range which is that this this line right here is a 50 percent retracement of the recent peak to trough action so here's the the peak here's the trough so when the day first started it dropped to here this is where i got in because i decided that this was going to be um, going up and I wanted to get in as low as possible and if it got down too far if it got down below 25 then I am suddenly deciding that this is no longer bullish that it's going to drop further um, so I got in here thinking that I would add up to about 25 um, and that also happens to be about where the the <laughs> mid candle was of the previous peak to trough like here's the, the previous trough here's the peak here's in between so these stable this is all from the Fibonacci study by the way you can get this one too from that Google Doc um, so this told me this line here so obviously my brain saw this at the time I wasn't thinking any of this I'm just sort of internalizing all of this stuff and then now regurgitating and trying to understand why I made the decision I made um, and this all pointed to me wanting to get in. I was actually in here in pre-market, and when it went up here, um, I ended up stopping out, but then getting back in just because price action looked like it was um, going to go for it again, which it did. I think that often happens, like in pre-market moves will happen um, right after to, to match it, um, which is why this number, like the, the, the pre-market high and pre-market low matter because often during the day that price action wants to try and duplicate those and then move move on from them. Um, so I got in here and, and it was partially based on the fact that this was the previous 50% mark of the, the peak to trough of the previous pri price action. Um, and then where it rebounded here, so I was already in at this point and I wasn't getting out, especially when it rebounded here, which, and this, this, dot, this was the opening range, um, but it's also the 50% the mark of the peak to trough from the opening, um, you know this is the bottom of the opening range and then it went all the way up here which was just above the the 161 mark which is also i mean you can kind of see the, these long-term stability points of this is the 161 of this mid candle so this peak to trough um, the longer these are the more they tend to create confluence later um, and you can see like this one's fairly long and it matches up pretty well with the opening range bottom i mean that's just I mean, that's why i got in here so, um, and, and this is all in the context of the larger trend, which is this, this um, 50 SMA. This is the daily 50 SMA that you can see running through here. This is where this is. And this is what got me into the trade in the first place was, was this break through it and retest and realizing that this is not gonna go away. So even if it drops down below, it's found this value here and it's in a longer term upward trend. So it could just keep going up. And there's a lot of reasons that, that like technical analysis reasons that price would move through here as well because it broke through certain risk levels. Um, you can see here that this was the the, the top of the, the recent risk level. You can look at a um, look at it on, on the 10 minute chart and this, this is often pretty illuminating. Um, you have a, a significant move here and then another one here, and when price action comes back down, it never breaks this candle. So you know this candle 
is still um, valid and this is still a good risk spot, you could even have had an entry there. Um, and, and, and in fact, if you were looking at the 50% FIB, this may have been a, a decision point for, for getting in. Um, this line right here was the pre-market high. That's, that's another area of confluence. So all of these numbers are related to each other mathematically. Um, and they just like all of that confluence just sort of adds up to like this would have been a good entry. You know, you know that as it's coming down to retest, it can break through, which is why you use this as a risk. If it broke through, then maybe you get out. But if it doesn't break through, the closer you can get into this line, the better off you are. That's how I got in down here. And I and I knew at this point that it was turning around when it bounced off of this this line um, and kept going up. Um, so anyway, that's the the 50 50 percent mark, and this is all based on the Fibonacci stuff. Um, the other the other thing that I learned is um, so that's like the sort of how the retracement numbers are are uh, related to the um, Fibonacci numbers are related to the the golden ratio and how that's sort of related to the fabric of the universe. Um, the other thing that I looked into was Poisson distributions, which are um, this guy in 1837. So Fibonacci was back in 12, 1200 or so. Um, even though back then his name was Leonardo Bonacci, some other guy in like the 1800s decided that he was son of Bonacci, which was Filios Bonacci. And that's how he's called Fibonacci now, which had nothing to do with what he was called at the time, which is kind of funny. Um, anyway, so the Poisson distribution is um, is also one of these statistical things that shows up all over the place um, in in, uh, in in math, where um, it's the the distribution of events occurring within a certain time period, so or or any kind of periodicity. Um, the a, a, a popular one is I think originally it was for he had done it based on the number of wrongful convictions. Um, over time, uh, but somebody has applied it to the number of stars in a, in a predefined square area, um, or they've used it to to um, statistically analyze um, uh, uh, collisions of data on a network or or earthquakes. Um, you know, you can have you know you're going to have a certain number of of um, you know 5.0 earthquakes in a certain amount of time when you statistically analyze, uh, analyze them, you, you can't predict when the next earthquake will be. But you know within a certain time period that we're going to see another 5.0 within X amount of time because statistically that's how many there have been. Um, so this Poisson distribution shows up in a lot of places. I, or I like this one, chewing gum on a sidewalk it, um, also follows because it's, it's a description of um, statistical analysis of otherwise random events that can that can group them in ways that are helpful to try and understand um, things like price action. Price action is it, it, like stock market fluctuations are also determined by this, um, and and they are uh, one one of the people who really um, elucidated that first was was uh, Lorenz. I'll actually get to him in a minute. The other thing that this paper went through was the uh, Hearst exponent, which I didn't understand what that was at first. Um, but that is, um, it's a way of, of using math to uh, describe how, uh, how random something is, like whether it's, it's got like a, a Brownian motion, which is like just pure randomness, or whether it's uh, reverting to a mean, so it's coming back and consolidating around a specific area, or whether it's trending and it's, you know, that, that specific area it's consolidating about is a, is a diagonal, uh, either up or down. Um, but it's not pure randomness. And so you can see that again in, in the movements around a specific area. So you have the 50 SMA and the movements around it on, on particular time frames are essentially random. Um, but, but you know, the higher up you go, it just basically plows right through it. I mean, it's not necessarily, um, it, it's not on, on every time scale. We'll get into fractals a little bit later, but like that that's the fractal nature of price action is that locally you may see something on one scale that isn't reflected on another scale. And often the bigger scales will show you better detail, which is like why I decided that long term I'm going to be long biased um, since last week. And that's, you know, on a, on a smaller level, like I, I could also play, you know, I, I could see this as a peak and, and, play a local short. Um, so that's not necessarily like just because the trend is up, it depends on which scale it is. And that Hearst exponent is, is a method of doing that. Originally he had used it. This is back in 1950 ish. Um, 
it's it, it was called the index of long-term dependence which relates um, previous historical uh, numbers to the current ones and and, and it, it sort of statistically shows the the um, reliance on on historical numbers which for price action is exactly what's happening I mean there is a lot of reliance on this um, historical uh, price action um, it, it is for me it's proof that the stock market is is non-random and that um, other people have suggested that that means that the efficient market hypothesis is invalid the e efficient market hypothesis is that markets are completely unpredictable or the market incorporates all possible information to converge on a on a value and i think i actually have a a little thing that that shows that here where it's like when you have new information it it um will price price will jump because now it's known and then it'll converge on a value after that um but until that information is known the the value hasn't actually changed um, but once it is known then then price action incorporates that value um which is which is true i mean the, this sort of initial impetus is definitely a reason why the market would push up um and and bounce it out of the 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 basin that it was in before and push it into a new area of value um but it doesn't necessarily predict anything else so um anyway so the the hearst exponent is just a mathematical measurement of that trend versus randomness um, depending on scale like whether it's it, whether it's consolidating or trending or it's just being random because sometimes it, it is just random um but it's it's uh, the, the idea is that it's you're, you're putting some math around like describing that, and that's one of the things I realized about a lot of this stuff is that these formulas aren't predictive; they are descriptive. They're telling you how this movement works mathematically, which doesn't really tell you anything. Like knowing that there's going to be a 5.0 earthquake in the next 10 years doesn't tell you when to go into your earthquake shelter. So I mean, it's not incredibly helpful except in terms of like 10 years later you know that you're you're due for one so you're going to be long biased towards a, a larger earthquake so you're going to step up your earthquake preparations or whatever which is not a guarantee that it'll happen but statistically these things are like mathematically um they're they're statistical i mean there's there's a probability there um but obviously the real world trumps that either way um but anyway, so this sort of led me to the the Richardson effect, which um, is this guy in also in in, in fifty um, was was studying the coastline between I think Portugal and Spain, and he was he was actually trying to find a, a Poisson distribution of um, the the length of of a conflict area. So this this would be the the um, the, the 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 length of a border versus the number of conflicts that arise on that border uh, but one of the things he noticed was that the 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 spanish and the portuguese were um defining that border differently which is kind of fascinating because they it's just based on how they measured it and, and what it turns out uh, and it's it's called the the coastline paradox um, but the idea is that the smaller the the segment of line that you use to describe um, the area of something, the smaller the segment is, the longer that borderline will be. Um, and this is this is all over um, f fractal uh, mathematics because the the idea of fractals is that it it, it involves incredible complexity at borders, um, like a Mandelbrot set, where you, you you zoom in on the on the border and it just gets more and more complex. You you don't know whether an arbitrary point you pick is inside or outside the line, because the closer to the line you get, the um, less predictable it is. The more complex that becomes, um, which is which is pretty fascinating. There's something called a, a Coke snowflake, which is um, it, it's if you take a triangle and then add a an upside down triangle on top of it you know creating a star of david and then add um triangles on each one of its resulting sides and then add another one i think it's it's this one um where you just keep adding them and it becomes it, it, you can add them infinitely um and what that ends up meaning is that uh the 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 length of the circumference of this this uh shape is infinite because it depends on, on what scale you're measuring it smaller and smaller and smaller um, but the area is still 
well defined and and that's that that's the really fascinating thing about it is that it's like you 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 can take any two points on this line and they are infinitely distant um which is it's kind of crazy anyway so the the original the hearst exponent um is related to the the uh, fractal dimension which is the ratio of complexity in this um in in, in any given um uh, differential system whatever again not a not a math person but um i'm just trying to to regurgitate the stuff that i found here which was really really fascinating um, but then that led me to uh, the Lorentz stuff, which I knew being fractals that it was going to come back to this at some point. Um, and, and I wanted to understand better because now I've, I've got kind of a handle on why and how Fibonacci numbers are related to stock market movements. It makes sense. I mean, that to me, it, it, again, it's, it's, a, it's a function of the algorithms that the, the, the you know, buyers and sellers are, are competing against each other. Um, and and this kind of showed how the tipping points worked where you would get to a point where um you've you've got price ranging around a value and then at some point something happens that pushes it out of that value area and then everybody piles on and it moves very very quickly out of that area and this is how you can determine risk i mean this is how i knew like I, i'm risking off of this this level because if price ever comes down below it i know that my position is blown and so i just stop out but my my probabilistic bet is that it's going to go away from that point in, in just fantastic speeds because um, this consolidation has led to that. It's like a springing coil, you know, and so the idea is that once it gets through a tipping point, um, everybody piles on because they know which direction it's going to go. So it moves very quickly through these areas. And um, all of these horizontal lines, the, all this eye cancer on my chart here, is um, these are all Jimmy zones that are, that are various risk levels at various uh, scales. So some of them are weekly, some of them are daily, uh, some of them are monthly. But you can see these, these big gaps in between. I mean, this is like 180 days back. And yet there's these huge gaps where price action has moved relatively quickly between them. Um, and that was what I was kind of shooting for in this, in this trade was, was, was trying to get to a point where um, I, could, I could see that, that price was gonna break through that area and move relatively quickly through this entire space because there's nothing there to stop it. I mean, there's nothing that I knew of there to stop it. There's this, um, there's a couple of like, like mid candles that do get respected like this. So this is a 161 from a previous peak to trough um, that had been very stable. And so that definitely like price action ended up uh, respecting that. But if you look on the bigger chart, this is where I got out of my trade. And that's partially why it was because I'm hitting these, these confluence levels of, of retracements. And I knew at the point that I could probably stay in longer um, or, or get back in here. Um, so yeah, no, I guess I didn't stay in all the way to the top. That would have been baller. But I, but I got out at, the, at, the, at this peak, which um, for, for lots of reasons. The other, the other reason was that that was about where um, this line was. This was another Jimmy Candle from uh, a four hour Jimmy Candle that for me was gonna be pretty telling, which it ended up being like a really stable value point. I mean, this is where price almost came back down to anyway, and then rested on top of it. Um, so we'll see what the, I mean, price could come back down from here uh, further, and then I'm no longer long biased, um, but I'm cautiously long biased going into next week because of because of this. Um, but anyway, the Lorenz attractors, so there, this is the, the tipping points that I'm describing, and he was working on weather systems. So he's looking at fluid dynamics, which is a bunch of differential equations, and realized that um, the initial conditions for these, these equations have a dramatic effect on which way they go. And if you look at the way this dot is moving, it's staying within this, this um, range of attraction until there's a tipping point which flips it over and then it comes back and then it flips around again and then it this i mean this to me looks a lot like how price action moves around these various levels the, and, and how important the level is depends on the scale you're looking at um but this is sort of how it works it, it crosses through it retests and if it retests this uh boundary condition then it then it pops into this other um basin and this is this is the the whole idea of attractors and you can have um and this goes back to Newton, where he, he realized these uh, base, basins of attraction, where you take a point and you, you say, is it within this basin or not? And the closer you get to the boundaries between the basins, the more complex 
it is to determine where that point is. And it's, it, it is, in the case of fractals, infinitely complex. And this is true of, of price action as well. I mean, like you can look at a, at a one minute chart for the same uh, region and, and see a different story. I mean, like there's, uh, there's again, like you could, you could be, you know, sh shorting within an uptrend because um, you don't necessarily know which one of these, these price levels is going to be um, up or down at this point, you know, zooming in. Um, on a bigger scale, you can kind of, judge bigger movements like you can see this has been moving up consistently through the last two days so chances are it'll continue moving up but the more resolution you get on that the less confident you can be in that upward movement the best you can hope for is to get in as low as possible and and ride that up and with the understanding that it could be turning at any point and it could have turned at this point and just kept going down because this was the peak after all um, you just have to optimize those those choices that you're making um, but the, the, the Lorenz stuff was all based on, uh, you know, the butterfly effect. So these, these small uh, inputs can have big results. And this is why market makers um, think they're more important than they are, because they do have an effect and they can have an effect. And it can be an effect of pushing it out of a tipping point into, um, a, a, into one of these basins, into the next, you know, Lorenz attractor. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that, that tipping point stuff that, that, can have like a lot, a lot of smaller effects can push it into larger effects. And this is all technical analysis. Obviously, you know, um, I, I have a suspicion that uh, the the price dropped um, when the when the queen died <laughs> the other day because um, it wasn't genuinely like widely known. But I think enough people did that that if it, it affected the market, you know, because why wouldn't it? Um, or for whatever reason, I mean, some for some reason it, it seemed to have an effect on the market, which could be purely coincidence. But again, we're here to recognize patterns, and if we can capitalize on those, we can make money, and that's the whole point of this. Um, so finally, that gets me to the, the the fractals. I mean, we've kind of been dancing around this for a while, but um, the idea is that this boundary layer gets more and more complex, um, but it's also self-similar, which means that uh, you'll see you'll see movements on on a, on a certain level where you can see um, you know candles forming, looking like this. Um, you know, you see the volume is is the same between these, but this one is so much smaller. So that means that um, this this is actually reaching a point where it's it's consolidating here and may re may reverse. And so this might be an entry. Um, and then you can see that this is why and this is why I use a six minute um, and a three minute chart for uh, for actual trading, because these boundary areas are often really well defined. Um, but you can see them on the 10 minute chart, too, like the 10 minute chart price never reached back above here. And so that's your entry and that's your risk. And so you can you can see that the move off of that is is pretty good. And that's all just based on like recognizing the patterns of candles on different time scales. And you can do that with any time scale. Um, you know, I mean, you can look at the, the, the four hour and see that this went all the way down to here and then returned and then kept going down. But at this point, once it passed its entry, you could enter here and risk off of this level and ride it up and just see how far it goes. And it went all the way up to here and then came back down again. And then, you know, again, you can see that this is a, this is a fairly strong level on the four hour. Um, and these are just patterns that work throughout any charts. I mean, I think it tends to be busier or noisier on the, on the smaller ones. Like so the one minute is less useful. There's actually a 10 second candle on, on the trade of eight platform, which I think is, is fascinating, but you could use a tick chart and all of that stuff is going to, um, be less useful at certain levels. And that's because of the way the, the math works with these, um, you know, because you're, you're actually hitting a, a hard deck here where the, the resolution stops at the tick level because there's no more transactions to be made at that point. Um, there's like, theoretically, you could, you could probably, um, look at, look at an approximation of the, the curve, but then you're just talking about a larger time scale. You know, like go look at the 10 minute, then you can kind of see what, what that direction might be. Um, anyway, so uh, Mandelbrot was the first one to come up with the idea of the fractal dimension, which is sort of codifying the ratio of complexity um, in, in particular scales using like the, the Hurst exponent. And there's, I mean, it's more complicated than that, but you know, whatever. I didn't understand all of that. Um, but again, he was using like when, when his work turned towards the stock market, he was using statistical analysis to show the non-randomness of, of the market. So once you know it's non-random, it's not necessarily predictable, 
um, but it's it's you know it's a it's a nonlinear determinism. It's it's these chaotic oscillations that you can take advantage of because you can see the patterns as they um, evolve. So the like what all this boils down to is that price action is fractally self-similar nonlinear chaotic oscillations. So you can see all of that all of that uh, Wikipedia ing got me to this point that I was already at before. I just wanted to sort of understand the math behind it. Um, which I still don't, but you know, I have a better, better sense of how all of this stuff is related. Uh, but it is built into the algorithm of buying and selling. It's not created by technical analysis. Technical analysis exploits it. In fact, people using technical analysis will actually lead to the degradation of, of it in, in many cases. But when you find this sort of confluence where it's like it's a 161%, there's no reason that the entire stock market is, is using FIBs. Like they're just not. Very few people do. I mean, it's not it's not as useful of an indicator because it's hard to understand and hard to explain and it's hard to to use reliably. You know, I mean, you can't just always get in or out on a 161. It just doesn't work that way. Although, you know, in this case, it did turn out to be the peak. Um, but there's a lot of times that happens where it's just like, well, I have to get out somewhere. This is why I don't have to find profit targets. I just wait and see how the price action actually looks at that point. And to me, it looked like this was topping out and you know, not enough so that it, it would come back on me, but I saved myself all of this time and I ended up not getting up and back in. I think I was doing something else or something. Um, I wasn't looking for another entry though, because I'd already made the, the big move that I wanted to make. And I'd actually captured the entire thing, which was, um, it's not all that usual. So it was kind of neat. Um, the, the exception though is psych levels. This is why I actually have a psych level study because 4,050 is a level that ends up getting respected. And you can see here that this is not, this is not a level that's based on anything else. Um, here it, it happens to correlate with a, a 10 minute uh, t uh, 20 EMA. Um, but a lot of that confluence is just sort of like false hope. Um, but I do think that this this level ended up being a, a pretty important one. Like that would have been another another additional piece of information for me to process using my pattern recognition to say that this is actually like I want to. I, I don't think it's going to keep crashing through. I think it's going to retest this fifty percent level and come back up. And that's you know that is what it did uh, because this level is is uh, psychologically important. Um, because for humans, they like nice round numbers on things, and and you'll often see price action interacting that way. Like here's the, um, there's there's the the four thousand, and the four thousand mark was a pretty big one because that's where um, you know price action got up to that point, bounced off of it, and then broke through it, retested, and then kept going. So that four thousand point is is actually. Um, ended up being pretty powerful. Like price consolidated just under it for a while, fell, but then broke up above, and then retested, rebroke, and then once it rebroke it, it kept going up. Like that was where where it started this new upward curve, um, just because of four thousand. It's a psych level. That's what happens. Um, but that's true of all price. Price tends to converge on locally important levels. That's why I have all of this garbage on my charts because they're all locally important levels for various reasons. And you can use it to explain lots of price action. I mean, like this is how I was fairly confident that it was that that when it was going up, my risk to reward would be pretty high because look at the size of this blank space. And this is just from like, you know, all, all of the time that I've spent writing studies and l watching screens, looking at the price action um, tells me that I'm I'm usually able to determine when price moves and why it moves there. I have some level nearby that that you can point to as, as a as a trigger for for that, you know, either rebound or consolidation. Um, and with enough of those levels, if you're missing spaces, then all of a sudden um, you start looking for reasons to get in because I mean, if it goes up, it has kind of a long way to travel here. So you want to be in for that whole move if you can. Um, and I'm, you know, I guess I'm still kicking myself that I got out and didn't actually take it the whole way up because I was expecting it to get all the way up here, uh, just because of this, this level. I mean, this, this to me was the, the 75 mark was going to be the top of that move. And so locally, I think price may go down again, um, at least to, to the, you know, I would expect it to come down to at least the 50 mark here, if not all the way back down to the, uh, 50 SMA and retest it. Um, but that's just sort of how I make my bigger picture decisions and how it gives me the confidence to stay in a trade once I'm in it. Um, this can also happen, like all of this breaking and retesting happens on price lines all the time. I mean, that's why trend lines work uh, is because 
you know, the price will come through and you can even use historical trend lines. I mean, I, I do this all the time. You've seen it here where price broke through it. Um, you know, it even retested, but then ultimately broke back down through it. And so basically it's been following this trend line on a larger scale um, pretty carefully, you know, until it finally did break through and then kept going. So trend lines and horizontal price lines are, are the same when it comes to the way price moves. So just because price is trending down, if it's trending down on top of a trend line that it just broke, that can actually be bullish. Once it diverges from that trend line, it could go up. It's just, it looks more like consolidation or even going down because locally the price trend is down, but the, the overall trend itself hasn't broken downward. Um, which is kind of fascinating. So you have um, the, the other other important levels are like you know fibs and extensions, like the fifty percent or the hundred one hundred sixty one percent. Like those can often be levels. I tend to use those more in confluence with other levels. Like this is a high from a previous um, point or or something like that. Um, the other thing that I've used is like a like a uh, ADR or ATR, which is the average daily range or the true range, and this is just the average of how far it will move. In, in a given day, right? So this made it to 92% of its move. For me, if I'm in here and this is the bottom and it's trending up and it goes all the way up, I'm gonna see that and once it gets near 100%, I'm probably gonna think about scaling out because statistically, I mean, that's that's about where, like if the daily range is only 71 points, I'm not gonna make more than 71 points in a day, statistically, it's just not likely. I mean, sometimes it does happen and that's how that average keeps where it is, but generally it'll it'll, hover around that. So it's another derived level that you can use and it did get very close to it. I mean, oftentimes it'll get close to 100% movement and you know that that's a good time to get out. That's why in the highs and lows indicator that I have, I actually have that as one of the levels. So you can see like price action could have gone all, all the way up here um, to make it to 100%, but it, it didn't because that's obviously the, the price was gonna turn before that for other reasons. Um, but there are a lot of reasons that these derived levels will work. Um, so it's it's not possible to predict where price will pivot, but you can definitely predict all of the levels it might pivot at and use that to optimize your entries based on the the you know all of this other stuff that's going on that you have to internalize and, and make quick decisions on. Um, like knowing the difference between like flipping your bias really quickly between bearish and bullish. Like if this had fallen much further, then that's this is a this becomes a tipping point. Um, but this let me optimize my trade because I got in as low as possible. I mean, I think I was I was in at like 29, and that's pretty low given that that was the low of the day. Um, and it was all just based on my my hunch that the price was going to continue up on the longer term because it had been going up. And so I was just looking for the lowest possible entry. Um, and this, the, the, all of this confluence between these, these otherwise derived numbers points to an internal structure of the price that tends to get respected. And it's not because people are aware of it, it's because they're not. And, it, and it's just built into the math of how these, these algorithms are, are functioning, of buying low and selling high. Um, you know, I mean, this 161 mark is not something that people are, are looking at. It just happens to be... Um, within confluence of other factors and enough of them together is a cascading effect that makes price action real at that point. It makes it actually respect that level. Um, and, and it's because that's the way the market moves as a whole. You know, I mean, it moves too far out of line and it tends to be, for whatever reason, follows that 161-ish area and then will bounce off of it. And, I, you know, I mean, you can see this all over the place, especially with these, again, longer, more stable periods of price action um, where it... it it consolidates. Um, that consolidation provides the markers for where price will go next, not because people are expecting it to go there, but because that's how the, the math of, of this, this works out. I mean, it's part of the, the Fibonacci sequence, which is, I mean, that's just straight mathematical equation. Um, and again, you don't know price is going to turn there. It's based on a lot of other things. That's just another thing that you can look at that it often probabilistically will um, so you can take that into account, knowing that you've optimized that trade as much as you possibly could have. Um, so it's, you know, that's that's just the, the, the way that you can find the value because it oscillates around that value. So you can see the value here is that, I mean, it's, it's trying to converge on that 50% mark. I mean, that's that's the, the, the goal is to figure out where the 0 and 100% are, not where the 50% are, although you could use that as an entry for the next leg up. Um, but it's also just as possible that if, if the price hadn't continued um, 
changing value at that point, you know, because it's a moving target, it's possible that it could have just converged around this. You know, like if it's a slow news day and there's actually nothing happening, it's totally possible for price to just converge on um, on an area. And in in, in less, um, th this is an index, so that's less likely to happen. But on on um, volume, like lower volume stocks, that that will often happen, where it'll just sort of consolidate around a certain price level, and that's just what it's worth, because that's what we have collectively decided that's what that particular stock is worth for whatever reason. And you can see pump and dumps bounce off of that all the time for various things. And that's why news can often have such a startling effect on small caps because um, often their float is low enough that very few people can jump in and cause a very large movement very quickly, um, which I, you know, and I used to play those, they were just a little too random for me. I, that's why I like the stock index because um, you know any of these market indexes because they are a slower moving less susceptible to drastic movement unless it's totally explainable like you know if there's going to be an fomc a meeting you're probably going to want to you know you could you could play the volatility i guess but you don't know which way it's going to go necessarily that's a new information thing that will propel the market one direction or another it'll knock these electrons out of their orbits because it gives it enough energy to push it into that that next basin um so it's all about finding patterns in the chaos um, and then then understanding risk levels versus value levels. So like this is a risk level, but the value level is somewhere higher up, right? I mean, like if, if it drops below, the value level is going to be somewhat further down. Um, and you can probably guess that it's probably going to be the last time you had a 0% um, because that's where other people are risking off of. You're always looking for where people are risking, but then also where the value will end up residing. So if you're risking, you know, you're in here, or even if you're, let's say you're you're in up here, let's say you chased it, and you're, you're then risking off of all of this down here, because if it goes below that, you know there's no reason to be in this trade anymore at all. I mean, this is a terrible place to risk, but if you catch it and go all the way up, and then realize at this point that you've you've hit the peak, then you you can sure you can you can make that. it's not optimized. I mean, the goal is to get in as low buy low and sell high. That's the algorithm. That's what everybody's trying to do. So if you miss it, there's I mean, every entry is an exit. There's lots of people in here who are willing to sell you their um, contracts and and get out because this is enough of a move for them or whatever. You know, there's lots of reasons why people are buying and selling. That's the that's the the volume that you get that makes all of this possible. Um, so once you understand where your risk is, uh, that'll help you understand where the value is. And once you understand where the value is, you can see th this is just risk only negative. It's all like, that's the other reason this is, this is mathematically derived. It's inverse. It, it's invertible. Like you can take this entire chart and flip it over and all of these would still apply. You know, the trends up and down is irrelevant. The positive or negative numbers are irrelevant. It's 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 the fact that you're trying to buy low and sell high that matters that creates these algorithms. Um, so this right here, if you're a short, is a great place to, to get in because you know that price has moved as far as it's going to get. Um, based on a number of different factors, you could decide that, um, you know, maybe historically 4065 was a big level. And so as the close, actually, I think that's one of the reasons I got out there was that 4065 was a, was a, was a level. Um, and so I wanted to get out there and a lot of people did. And a lot of people see that and, and also want to get out at the same spot. So like, that's just, that's just where it happens. Um, so that was my exit, but you could also, if you're, you know, incredibly amazing you could just reverse your position there and then write it back down again um, because once you start spotting these pivots and, and consistently catching them um, why are you getting out if you're not also getting in the other direction you know like you should be staying in if you're confident it'll keep going up and like long term i was pretty sure this wasn't going to come all the way back down and drop but i didn't know and at the time it seemed like i'd made a, a big enough move so i figured that was where i was going to cut it so i cut it around 63 um and, and managed to capture most of that move, um, which is is neat. I mean, and the only reason you do that is because this is chaotic. It's not random. It's chaotic. I mean, it, it, it is random, but it's it's chaotic. It's it's a, a, um, deterministic but complex. And because value is an ever moving target, um, it, it oscillates. And and that's what you're looking for is how these oscillations move and on what scale they're moving. And, and understanding how to optimize your entries to take advantage of that. Um, scale is really important. That's because it's fractal. Like the, the, the higher the scale, you know, if you're on a, on a four hour chart and seeing a trend that's upward, 
um, you know, it makes sense to be long biased on a lower chart, even if price is moving down, you know, you, you, you know long term that it's probably moving up unless you're at an inflection point where things can flip. Um, which you also have to be on, on the lookout for. I mean, you can you, you need to be able to flip bias at any moment because um, because because of that randomness because it's not predictable. Um, what the only thing that's predictable is the is um, the probabilistic extremes. You know, like it's it's more likely that price will turn in certain areas, um, but that doesn't mean that it's always going to uh, because it's not predictable. Um, so again, I mean, we're all really, really sophisticated pattern recognition machines. Um, screen time matters. The more you look at these things, the more you just sort of internalize all of the information that's going into it. And lately, I've started trading without any indicators at all, just watching the price action. You know, and, and you can kind of tell from price action um, if you've been staring at it long enough. You can kind of tell when when you know sellers are getting the upper hand, when buyers are starting to get exhausted. And locally, you know that that's maybe a good place to to get out or go short. And then, you know, when price turns again, you can kind of see it in the chart because if you've spent enough time looking at it, all of this information, all of these levels get internalized and you can start seeing them. I mean, it, it helps to know historically where risk levels were because those absolutely matter. I mean, that's that's the, the Hearst exponent in action, right? I mean, this is the, the, the spooky price action at a distance. Um, there's no reason that something that happened six months ago should really have any effect on price here, but it does because that's where historically price has interacted acted um, more dramatically locally and that's where it will again um, so you're just looking for for these exploitable patterns of probability and recognizing the, the the risk and value areas and once you understand those then all of this stuff gets a lot more legible it gets a lot more readable um, and for me like the the real uh, understanding of this came from James LaFaith you should look him up on uh, Twitter and and ask him about his uh, how he he uses his system to determine value because he actually has a method for walking through at different time scales and determining the 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 actual value without I mean I I do it using these indicators but a lot of these indicators are based on his ideas of how price action works and I had never seen anyone in the um, the sort of I guess I'll call it the freelance trading community. Um, the 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 of, of people who are, are professionals but not necessarily working for a group, um, but I hadn't ever seen anybody describing price that way. And and outside of these these scholarly articles that I've been reading, I haven't really seen anybody using this in in the way that that he used it. And it really was eye opening for me to understand that these risk levels are one hundred percent the reason price moves the way it does. And so that's why. Um, you know, for me, I would get out at 65 because historically that was a risk level. And on a larger chart, that is still a risk level. That's why things move here. It's not market makers deciding that, you know, they have orders to fill in this area. It's that the orders themselves are created by the area because it's a good level, because this is a tipping point level. This is where, where, where price can move violently one direction or another. And that's why you want to get in there. That's why there's more orders there. It's not because some arbitrary market maker is like, well, you know, I want, I want this at 465 and nothing else. Like that's not how it works. It works because of the risk levels involved on various timescales. And so if you can map those risk levels, you can have a very good idea of where this stuff is. So again, look up James LaFaith um, on Twitter. I'll link in the description here. Um, and he's, you know, he's he's just got a wealth of information on his Twitter about how to find this value, how to read these charts at different scales to understand where the value is and where your risk is. And, and those are the two things you really need to understand in trying to piece out like why this stuff is happening. All of that math is is basically irrelevant. All you really need to know is where your risking and what the value is so that you can understand these oscillations as they unfold and you can adapt to them as they change because value is i mean how much does the stock market cost well i mean it costs whatever it is at this time you're distilling all of that into a single number and it's as a number meaningless unless you understand the forces behind it and why it's moving the way it's moving so you don't need to know the formula for the hearst exponent but it, it helps to know that it's non-random and that it that it, it is on uh, some scales 
probabilistically determined. And so you can start using that, even though it's random, you can, you can use the oscillations within it to um, optimize your trades, to actually make money at it, which is totally possible. Um, it just takes time, that's all. So anyway, um, I've probably gotten an enormous amount of the math wrong on this because again, I'm not a mathematician, I'm just a programmer, um, but I've been trying to synthesize all of this, um, the ideas of fractals, because the way that Investopedia describes fractals is not, it's misleading. It, it, it takes candle shapes and says that this is a fractal because it can happen on different scales. And when it does this, it means it's a bullish and it's a bearish. And, and it's like, that's not what fractal means in this case. Fractal means that on all time scales, we're looking for these tipping points um, because that's where the complex price action happens. Are we going, is, is, is value going up or down? We don't know, and and the, and the further down you go to like a one minute chart or whatever, it's it's less possible to tell. On a larger chart, it's easier to tell. You know, for any given time, you know whether price should be above or below it. But the further down you go, the more complex that boundary line becomes, and that's why it's fractal. Um, so anyway, even though the math is wrong, it's still been really fascinating for me in a kind of you know drill the two hundred and fifty six decimal. Um, number out of your head from uh, there's a movie called Pi, which is obviously inspired by these uh, these same confluences in the in the math, um, which is just so fascinating for me that there's this beautiful structure underlying all of this stuff that um, we 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 rarely get to glimpse. And if we understood it even a little better, it would help us take advantage of of how these algorithms, how the math works and how it creates structure that we can take advantage of. Um, so anyway, um, if you've listened this far, probably you're not a mathematician or you are and you're getting ready to roast me in the comments, which, you know, feel free. I would love to hear it.